Good morning, my friend. The Marketplace of Ideas is open. It's great to have you along. Well, just minutes ago, the U.S. Senate has passed that $95 billion national security supplemental package. This is with money going to Ukraine, Israel, uh, as well as uh, humanitarian assistance for Gaza, about $5 billion for the Indo-Pacific, and there are many who are none too happy about it. Senator Rand Paul, front and center, in his reaction to this, he spoke out about this uh, latest plan in the Senate to send this uh, this package to Ukraine, Taiwan, and other countries. And this was uh, Senator uh, Rand Paul on the floor of the U.S. Senate yesterday. Open the champagne, pop the cork. The Senate Democrat leader and the Republican leader are on the way to Kiev. They've got $60 billion they're bringing. I don't know if it'll be cash in pallets, but they're taking your money to Kiev. Now, they didn't have much time, really no time and no money to do anything about our border. We're being invaded. A literal invasion is coming across our border. 800,000 people came illegally in the last month. And all they had time to do in the Senate was get the money, get the cash pallets, load the planes, get the champagne ready, and fly to Kiev. So more on Senator Rand Paul's comments here in the morning, uh, uh, in a moment. But the final vote, pretty overwhelming, 70 to 29 in favor so Republicans, and that vote just taking place uh, this morning. Um, actually, in the last uh, 30 minutes or so, that the final votes ca- uh, came in. So there have been a number of uh, Republicans who voted against this. Senator Rand Paul among them, he said, this bill gives the finger to American taxpayers. He said, this bill gives the finger to all of America. This bill is Ukraine first, America last. So other Republicans voted for it. Republican Senator Jerry Moran of Texas became emotional in his support of the bill, and he said, I believe in America first, but unfortunately America first means we have to engage the world. Mitch McConnell had back funding for this, and he said, I know it's become quite fashionable in some circles to disregard the global interests we have as a global power, to bemoan the responsibilities of global leadership, he said. And this was on Sunday. He said to lament the commitment that has underpinned the longest drought of great power conflict in human history. This is idle work for idle minds, and it has no place in the United States Senate. He was saying, so Republicans passing it. And Senator Rand Paul and his criticism uh, the last few days has been been pretty clear. He said, I meet no one in Kentucky and no conservatives across the land that are for this. But the leadership of the Senate under Mitch McConnell is more concerned with sending your money to Ukraine than they are with the invasion of the southern border. And I've had enough, and I'm going to do everything in my power to slow down and stop this. I told them they can vote when hell freezes over, because frankly, this isn't in the best interest of our country, and the money has to be borrowed. He said, we don't have $100 billion sitting around. We borrow $1.5 trillion, and they're going to borrow another $100 billion. He said, we essentially, $100 billion. And certainly we're asking China to send money to Ukraine. It makes us weaker. It is bad for the country. And Mitch McConnell, Joe Biden, and Chuck Schumer are wrong on this. And I'm going to do everything I can to slow them down at the very least. And possibly there'll be enough of an uprising of people calling and saying, Mitch McConnell, who are you? Do you represent the Republicans and conservatives or are you in lockstep with Schumer? There needs to be an uprising, and we need to have a chance to stop this. So those were among the comments of Senator Rand Paul as he was speaking. I think those were comments he made to uh, Fox Business 
uh, the Fox Business Network talking about this. And we'll get to uh, your reaction coming up this morning. House Speaker Mike Johnson released a statement last night slamming this foreign aid package, $95 billion foreign aid package. And he said the Senate bill failed to meet the moment, he said. House Republicans were crystal clear from the very beginning of discussions that any so-called national security supplemental legislation must recognize that national security begins at our border. The House acted 10 months ago to help enact transformative policy change by passing the Secure Our Border Act, and since then, including today, the Senate has failed to meet the moment. This was a statement that Johnson released. House Speaker Mike Johnson. So he said the Senate did the right thing last week by rejecting the Ukraine, Taiwan, Gaza, Israel immigration legislation due to its insufficient border provisions. And it should have gone back to the drawing board to amend the current bill to include real border security provisions that would actually help end the ongoing catastrophe. But he said instead the the Senate's foreign aid bill is silent on the most pressing issue facing our country. Do you agree with that? I mean, I think that's part of the conversation that you and I will have this morning. Is that the most pressing issue facing our country? He said the mandate of national security supplemental legislation was to secure America's own border before sending additional foreign aid around the world. It's what the American people demand and deserve. So we'll talk about that. We'll get into that in more details coming up. Uh, Get your reaction, your thoughts. You can drop me an email anytime if you've got time this morning. Feel free to drop me an email, greg.belfridge at keloam.com is my email address, and I love hearing from you. So National Review did a report yesterday on this issue of, you know, the illegals that have flooded the flooding into the country. And so National Review then spoke with activists and Democrat candidates in Chicago on the growing number of migrants in Chicago. And there are a number of them who are in disagreement with the mayor of Chicago. The mayor of uh, Chicago has said that the migrant crisis could flip the state of Illinois purple. But there are some of the reaction from folks in that area. I think uh, National Review talked to um, a candidate for the Cook County Board of Commissioners. And she was particularly vocal on public funds being used to house migrants instead of helping the homeless. She said, we have people who come here illegally who have jumped the line, she said. She also rejected Mayor Brandon Johnson's uh, attempts to try to blame Texas for what they are seeing happening. And... She understands what's going on. She says it's a Biden thing. It's a Pritzker thing. She's talking about the governor of uh, Illinois, J.B. Pritzker. It's a Brandon Johnson thing. They wanted sanctuary cities. It's not Abbott's fault because he didn't ask for it. We asked for it. It's just a lot, and it's overwhelming, she said. She's among those who was uh, interviewed by National Review yesterday. Also, a peace activist, Dr. Laura Chamberlain, pushed back on the idea that Abbott was to blame. What state could possibly take in millions of refugees, she said. And she said, the reality is, if you look at Chicago now, you have unemployment rates among African, uh, uh, African-American youth in particular. You have a lack of mental health services in Chicago. You have thousands of homeless people in Chicago already that were never, ever focused on like they are focused on the migrants, she said. 
And she said, I'm not against them living their lives. It's creating too much competition between poor people in Chicago that never, ever received this level of support. Never, ever, she says. And our... Also, uh, um, there are a number of uh, activists that are that are responding to this. So this was uh, oh, this is uh, that last comment was from Teal Hardiman, and a uh, Hardiman said, "I'm not against them living their lives. Too much competition between poor people in Chicago," he said. And he said that the mayor's policies have really discouraged him. He said, if I was the mayor right now, I would make an executive decision to bring an end to Sanctuary City in Chicago. I would get rid of it because we're not prepared to deal with it. These are Democrats who are saying this. They understand the reality of the situation really is... Um, and I mentioned this, uh, Zerlina Smith members, who was a Cook County, uh, candidate for the Cook County Board of Commissioners. And she said, there's a division in our Democratic Party. It is weakened. It is going to get worse. The city of Chicago voters have woke up. The state of Illinois voters have woke up. And they're not standing with our old leadership, she said. The immigration crisis is going to flip the state of Illinois purple, she said. So the mayor's not responding to comment, but these are Democrats in Illinois who are saying, the, we asked for this. We asked for this, and they're not blaming uh, Texas. In fact, they... They seem to understand what state of Texas is going through, which is one of the reasons then that I think there were a number of reasons why Texas Governor Greg Abbott decided to send, you know, some of these people who are coming into the country illegally to send them into these other areas so that we would, so that Democrats would wake up to the reality of what's going on. And you, you're beginning to see that happen in Illinois, where Democrats are pushing back against their own Democrat mayor in uh, in uh, in Chicago. Um, pretty crazy. It's, continues to be a big story. There are a lot of them today. <laughs> also, Donald Trump has requested that the Supreme Court the U.S. Supreme Court, block a ruling from the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals saying that he does not have presidential immunity in the January 6th case against him. So, as you know, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals just recently ruled against Trump. He now is requesting that the U.S. Supreme Court take up this issue. And... His uh, legal team is saying any executive immunity, um, or excuse me, I think this was the the court, the appeal, or the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, had said any executive immunity that may have protected him while he was president no longer protects him against this prosecution. That's what he's appealing. Also, Fannie Willis has got. Uh, ongoing problems. Fannie Willis may be disqualified from the uh, Trump case in Georgia. And a Georgia judge has said, made it very, very clear in recent days that Fannie Willis has got to address the facts against her with respect to Nathan Wade, her lover, um, The Fulton County Judge Scott McAfee is presiding over this case. 
And he said, I think it's possible that the facts alleged by the defendant could result in disqualification. I think an evidentiary hearing must occur to establish the record of these core allegations, he said. So as there has been, you know, more scrutiny of Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade, who is her lover, who now is is the one who is trying to prosecute this Georgia Trump case, you know, you put yourself out there in the spotlight, well, the spotlight's on. It's on on each of them and what they've been doing. And the judge is saying, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's concerning. So this is. A case that uh, that was brought by Michael Roman, he was he's looking to dismiss the charges against him and Trump on grounds that Willis and then her lover Nathan Wade financially benefited from prosecuting the case. Wade had bought plane tickets in Willis's name to destinations such as Miami, San Francisco, so on. And then a subsequent filing by Willis admitted to a personal relationship, but he argued there was no financial interest for her, uh, for herself, or for Wade. She said, "So, but there, you know, she was reluctant at first to even acknowledge that that relationship was ongoing, and now she's saying, well, yes, there is a personal relationship.'" But there was no financial interest there. She said Special Prosecutor Wade made much more money than the other special prosecutors only because Wade did much more work on the Trump case, she said. Uh, The judge so far doesn't seem to be buying any of it. Also, the did you see that the uh, president has, even though he has... (laughs) The White House has been very concerned about the use of TikTok. Oh, we're very concerned. The Biden administration, very, very concerned about the use of TikTok and what's happening on TikTok. So much so that President Joe Biden is now uh, trying to appeal to younger voters via TikTok. President Joe Biden is now putting, you know, using TikTok to uh, try to sell younger voters on how great Joe Biden is for the United States. And the uh, Democratic Senator Mark Warner, he's the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, he said yesterday he's concerned about this decision by the White House. And he said, I think we still need to find a way to follow India, which is prohibited TikTok. I'm a little worried about a mixed message. I think he's right to me. So the Democrats are all about mixed messages. I mean, it's just just incredible. There is an ad from the Super Bowl that's getting a lot of attention here over the last couple of days. It's a religious ad campaign that ran during the Super Bowl. It's run for the last couple of years. There were two commercials on Sunday night centered on Jesus' message to love your neighbors. And these ads have really caught the attention of a lot of people uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, Some are criticizing them, saying they're overly woke. Um, other, so you have people on the right who are criticizing them, some on the left who are criticizing them, um, and just about all, everybody in between who is criticizing these ads. I don't, they're worth talking about, I think, getting the message of Jesus Christ out there, um, It's been a 
really, a, really a big story since the Super Bowl. One of the other big stories this morning is the woman who opened fire at that uh, Houston area mega church on Sunday. She has been identified. Um, also, now we're learning that she had previously written anti-Semitic writings. She had a she has a, a history of mental health issues. She used a weapon with a Palestine sticker in the attack. Apparently, she was there with a, a, a seven-year-old boy. Her son, who is uh, not well, he's fighting for his life. According to police, they talked about this yesterday, is in critical condition. So police were asked, you know, was the child shot by an officer? And all they would say, this, this question was on Sunday, and all police would say was that female, that suspect, put that baby in danger? I'm going to put that blame on her. So we're learning a lot more about the shooter. And that's a look at today's big stories.